What is up, Bills Mafia? We are kicking off London week for your Buffalo Bills in a big way on uh, the Shout Buffalo Bills football podcast. As always, brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets. Are you ready for Slider Sunday? It's going to be weird. You're going to get up at 930 in the morning. You're going to have to watch a football game. I get it. But every, every time you visit slidersunday.com, you have a chance to win free products, brand swag, tailgating gear, trips, and more to get you ready for game day. One chance per day, no purchase necessary. Let's get into it. We have an awesome guest. And for those of you that don't know, Phoebe Schechter, former Buffalo Bills coach and now uh, NFL expert over on Sky Sports. She is a flag football player, uh, a football coach over in the UK. We got a lot to talk about with her uh, here today. Phoebe, how do you do it all? I guess that's the best place to start. Oh man, take advantage. I learned a lot in Buffalo of taking advantage of every minute of every day. So I try and do that as much as possible, but it's easy when you love what you do. So yeah. So take us through like, what's a day in the life like for you? Because you're kind of juggling a couple of different balls out there. And, and what's it like being in like media now? How long have you been doing that? And, and, and what kind of, how you kind of compartmentalize all your time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a day in my life is quite full on. I think like you alluded to, I, I do kind of wear a few different hats, whether it's being a coach educator over here in the UK. I work as a coach for our, our national program as well. Uh, the Sky Sports piece, I mean, getting ready in terms of a, a media piece. And Matt, you know, I mean, how much prep time these sorts of things take indeed uh i still love going to the gym so that's i still need to find out time to fit that in um and just kind of like everyday life but i mean moving into this kind of broadcasting side of things has it was definitely not something i ever intended on doing and really just happened by accident during lockdown they were looking to have people remotely call in because nobody could go into studio and they were opening it up to more guests and did an episode then with them. And, and then to be honest, our main host had gotten COVID during lockdown and they thought, Ooh, who can we call? And that's not going to really screw this up too much. <laughs> and myself and another woman got a call and we hosted it. And now I'm with Sky Sports for the next couple of years. <laughs> that is awesome. So is it a weekly show where you guys are doing kind of like studio analysis for the market there? Precisely. So we have our Sunday show. We basically do like an hour intro. Um, we cover two games live because of the time difference. So when the games kick off at one, it's 5 p.m. Uh, well, 6 p.m. I guess <laughs> at that time over here in the UK. And then we do the 930 game. And then when it gets to 1230, 1 a.m., we do hand over. There's, I don't know if there's enough coffee for me at that time of the morning. <laughs> but it's great because essentially when you're watching the game in the States and they go to TV timeouts, or uh, they go into studio with, you know, Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson, they come into studio with us. And it's myself, Jason Bell, who's a former player for the Giants and Cowboys, and then our host, Neil Reynolds. And we break down the game, we really try our best to make it make American football easily accessible for the everyday viewer. Because keep in mind, the NFL is not necessarily the number one sport over here quite yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So what's this part of the season like for you too like is it is it more intensive do you do anything extra when like for instance last week's game with the Jags coming there and then obviously the Bills coming this week what is how does that change things for you guys yeah so that's great because as you know all these NFL teams first off want to do community work which we love the fact that not only are you doing work in back in the states in your own like markets you're now coming over here with the growth of the global markets programs so all the teams want to do community work. So we run events with the young people. So we work with schools. We work with kind of your essentially elementary and high school age because it's all about teaching them American football. We do flag football. Um, so we do a lot of that. There's just a bunch more events. So like we have the practices going on. You've got press conferences that you can attend because for most people, this is the only access to really a team, right? In terms of being able to get that face-to-face -face interaction with the players, with the staff, with the coaches. And uh, it just, it's so exciting, especially now because we've got the three UK games and then two in Germany, mm -hmm. you know, it's just full on now, basically until Thanksgiving time. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Jacksonville, Atlanta in a few moments, obviously bills, dolphins, 
Uh, I told you before, I, I just got finished with my rewatch of the game and it held up. It was as impressive as it was live in person at Highmark Stadium. But I want to go back a couple years with you because you have this really cool, you know, um, scope into this Bills organization from the beginning stages before it ever really turned into what it's become. And I'm super interested to know if you kind of saw the writing on the wall a little bit. I mean, Sean comes in here, Brandon comes in here, they kind of reshape the culture. You know, that's been heavily covered over the years and, and how much players have mentioned you know, the, the structure here and the way that they treat players and what that means to potential free agents and guys coming in. But did you see elements of a successful organization organization back in 17 and 18 when you were here so much so that maybe you're not surprised with how good it's been and, and consistently it's been good? Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the questions I, I love the most in terms of I get to watch the games now and see everything that Sean and, and, Brandon were trying to install back then, right? It, it's pretty cool for me to kind of have been a part of that process at the very beginning. And now every week, the rest of the world gets to see this. And, you know, one of the things I always remember is just our first ever staff meeting. It was going into training camp in 2017. And I was hanging on every word that Coach McDermott was saying, because I felt like my values were so aligned with what he was saying. And I'd never had imagined that a football coach in the NFL, a head coach would be thinking that way. And just because I'd never experienced someone like, like coach McDermott, I mean, he is so unique and, you know, there's so many people that talk about culture and it's such a kind of buzzword, but when you get to be around coach McDermott, the entire organization day to day, and you understand what it means to install that culture. And that doesn't mean that things are easy, right? There's been ups and downs. There's been hard decisions, hard conversations, but when your vision is so clear and he made sure that everybody in that building knew that, right? From people who worked in the cafeteria, you know, the chefs to the front office to ticketing, you know, janitors, everybody knew what the vision was for Buffalo. And now to see where the team's at and see all of that hard work and the repeated messaging coming to fruition, it's it's really just incredible. And it's so heartwarming because it's inspiring for me to be able to see, hey, you plant the seed here and look what it can grow to. Mm -hmm. You said something interesting there. You said you sat in that meeting and so much of, you know, your philosophy or your mindset, I can't remember the word you use, was so much aligned with Sean. Like what, what kind of examples do you have of that? Like where things that he was saying were things that, you know, you, you kind of connected with. I think a lot of it was around the actual care of the players and how important that kind of human piece of, of the NFL is, right? Because Really, the NFL is a business at the end of the day. But when you get to every week pull a team together, pull individuals together to create a family where, as we know, at any moment, any of these players could be let go, but yet you're still able to make them fully buy into what you're saying, you know, literally from, from what heart is when you walk into the building and understanding what, what exactly is that? What is hard work? What does... What does accountability mean? Because again, we can use these words, but if we don't live them every day, you know, you're just, you're essentially reading the playbook, but you're never running the plays. And I think that's a, it was quite powerful at the time. And, and even now to see what he's done, how he's delivered that message. And more importantly, the people, the coaches, the staff that he has put around him and put around the team to be able to deliver the message. Because it's all well and good if the top is up here and there. This is what we're believing in, but it's the people who in, who interact with these athletes every single day. You know, your your sports therapists, your psychologists, you know, your your team pastor. You know, those are all the people that have those day to day experiences, and and they're ones that really shape the lives of these athletes. You know, I've covered. So I started on the beat um, three months after the Bills drafted Josh Allen. Uh, I was at, out in Las Vegas for a few years, uh, came back. I'm from Buffalo. My wife's from Buffalo. Uh, so we uh, picked a pretty good time to come back and cover yeah. this team. So I've, <laughs> I've been here for the majority of Sean's run. And this offseason has been interesting because there's been this national narrative around Sean, like this Bills team is that hasn't been able to get over the hump, right? Like year after year, there's been things that they faced. Um, so much so that like it's felt like people have tried to force him onto some type of hot seat. And 
every interview that I've done, national radio, TV, whatever the case may be, I, I, I heavily push back on that because, and I, I think we're sitting here after the first month of the season, it's easy to see what kind of position they're in and the job that he's doing now as the de defensive play caller. All that pushed aside, people forget so quickly what the 17 years were like before him and Brandon got here and the sustained success of five playoff appearances in six years, the job that Sean did in the DeMar Hamlin situation to me is so as an outside observer, I have a respect for what Sean has done as a football coach, but as a leader uh, around how hard that situation must have been to me, that means so much more, the human element, the way that people talk about him. And, and I get the sense that, you know, you share those, the, the way that a lot of people have not only praised him, but appreciate how he handles things in the building. Yeah. And I mean, you're so spot, spot on, especially looking at the DeMar Hamlin situation. I don't think there is another head coach or person in the league that would have handled it as well as he did. And, you know, with whatever information he had around him, the way that he supported his team, bringing an extra psychologist, you know, just it was more than just one person. I think he understood what that that meant. But I mean, you look at Buffalo the past year, the amount of adversity that they've been through. I don't, you know, including DeMar, but, you know, Dawson Knox's brother and you had the shooting in Buffalo before that. Um, you know, there were so many different things getting stuck in at Christmas time. You know, I mean, the yeah. list genuinely goes on. And when you start to really think about it, I mean, I don't know how many leaders could really manage that situation. And, you know, I know, I think one of the things that, that Coach McDermott and I bonded on early was just learning from other leaders, right? And he does so much studying and reading about other forms of leadership and, and other successful leaders out there. And I think when you are of that growth mindset where you're constantly trying to put yourself in the best position to grow and learn and develop, then you've got the world as your oyster because you're able to find things and be a great observer. And, and that makes you a great leader. A lot of times and you can just sit, listen, okay, well, what, what do my people need from me in, in these moments? I have a pretty good read on most uh, coaches in the bills organization, Rob Boris, maybe one that kind of flies under the radar. It's somebody that, you know, I've had, I've had a handful of conversations with, you can see him early and often on game day, doing his steps around the outside of the stadium, walking past our, our TV set. He doesn't say a lot. He's helped develop Dawson Knox. He's now in that spot, uh, developing Dalton Kincaid. You worked in the same position room with him. What What's he like? <laughs> I love Rob. I used to call him Mr. Rob. Um, I still do, to be honest. You know, it was really, I think working with, Rob was probably the biggest learning curve of my career because I was the first intern he'd had in 13 years in the league. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. He does. When you meet him initially, he doesn't necessarily give off that overly friendly <laughs> vibe. Incredibly pleasant. But when you get to know him, I mean, you just love who he is as a, as a human being. And, you know, he challenged me so much coming in because really I had to think, five steps ahead of him, right? As someone who has been doing this role for so many years, it's easier for him just to do it again. You know, why would he want to teach somebody new to do something he probably felt he could do better? Mm -hmm. And the fact that it, it really pushed me. So, you know, as small things, whether it's setting up practice before he gets out there, finding out where the cameras are that are going to be filming for our positional group, letting him know. And he, he saw that I was, I was trying and I was doing my best and, you know, he, to the point where when Dawson Knox was a rookie and we had him in OTAs, you know, him, Tommy Sweeney, all those guys, he was like, all right, here are the rookies, install the offensive playbook with them and go. And for me, I mean, that that's the greatest honor coming from Rob because he's entrusting someone, he's empowering them. And so, yes, he is a, he's such, honestly, he's one of my favorite people in the world, but I know that he's, he takes a little bit of time to chip away at, <laughs> but I'm good at chipping away at people. <laughs> That's awesome. So what, what's your exact timeline? I was trying to kind of stamp that down because I couldn't remember all these years kind of melt together. You started oh with the bills when and until when? So I did my first training camp in 2017 and then I was with DB. So we had Gilbert as our, our coach back then. And then I came back for 2018 training camp through to 2019 through the whole season through to 2019 OTAs. So okay. I 
seen both sides of the ball, which is why it's also great that, you know, I got to be with Bobby Babich and learning from him and his beautiful mind of defense and, um, you know, obviously sitting in on all the meetings with Coach Frazier and, and Coach McDermott sitting in all those. So it's um, it was great because also my desk was literally right across from Coach McDermott's office. I had Brandon Bean there, you know, Terry Bagula. And then I had all my special teams defense guys here, offense around the corner. So like I was kind of in the middle of the melting pot, which I loved. <laughs> That's awesome. And you mentioned Bobby. I got to ask you about him because he's the opposite end of the spectrum to Rob because yeah. <laughs> Bobby is Bobby comes into a room. He commands the room. I remember his first press conference as the linebackers coach. And I think he went for 20 minutes and we were all kind of sitting around talking like, man, I mean, he, he feels like a future defensive coordinator, future head coach. I mean, he has that kind of um, just charisma. He does. And I mean, it was great because I got to work with him and his dad mm -hmm. at the same time. So Bobby was with safeties and, and obviously Bob Babich was with linebackers. And, you know, Bobby is is incredible. I mean, his his desire to learn and be the best at whatever he can do, um, you know, from from literally understanding scheme. He does all his research, whether he's talking to offensive guys. How can I pick your brain? You know, he really thinks outside of the box when it comes to developing himself and being able to develop his players. I mean, and then again, having the experience of growing up with your dad as a coach, I think he's learned so much from him, but you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, he, he commands a room. He's got such great energy. He's got this swag to him as well. Mm -hmm. um, his family is so wonderful. I've got to see, you know, his kids playing flag football across the years. And so, I mean, just a, an incredible group, but yeah, Bobby, Bobby is a very special guy and he definitely is going to go far. And I think, you can see that even by that move from going from safeties to linebackers, you know, the, the natural progression there is, is moving up to a, a D coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, you look at those linebackers, you you obviously were familiar with uh, early career Matt Milano and the way that he's developed into, you know, arguably the best off the ball guy in the NFL. I mean, he's so special in what he's done. He's having another terrific season. And now Terrell Bernard, who, you know, that pick was criticized. I'll raise my hand at times. I didn't really necessarily see the vision with it as well. Undersized guy. And all he's done in four games is come out and look like the perfect compliment to Matt. I mean, just from what you've been able to see so far from that trio, Bobby and the two linebackers and, and what they built with that group. My goodness. I mean, Matt has always been an intelligent player, right? I mean, he, he's been compared to Luke Keekley's, but he sees things the way that he, his instincts are. I mean, you see the way he shoots gaps and he just, he's so physical and he really imposes himself on you. Um, and, and, and like you're saying with that kind of pairing of Terrell Bernard, I mean, he's been outstanding again, the way that he feels and senses the football. I mean, he had a standout record setting game only last week and, mm -hmm. and for someone to come in at such a young age and take on a role that people weren't sure what it was going to be like missing Tremaine Edmonds. Right. And mm -hmm. Tremaine is a big guy, six foot six. I mean, wingspans, they were worried about how that, that works over the middle. I mean, Terrell Bernard has put everybody to kind of be silent in that matter because of his work ethic, but you know, coach McDermott, Bobby, they love guys that come in and are, are hard workers. Their size isn't, you know, almost if they're undersized, you kind of got that fight in you, right. That little underdog, bit which you know bills we love that right we want to we want to be the ones that you think oh you you think we can't do this perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's been great to see the way that those two work and you know how they're able to drop in coverage i mean watching trail on versus miami the way that he is so quick and the way that he can drop underneath those receivers you know he makes he forced so many that, that interception to hide was because he was able to use his speed and quickness and get out there and really force that throw to go higher. So, you know, he adds so much value, even if those stats don't necessarily come up. But when you watch him play, he is a disruptive guy. And it's it's interesting because one of the things I maintain with as special as of a athlete and as a player as Tremaine Edmonds was, there's limitations a bit because of that size at times, I think, especially in coverage against guys like Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell and Devin a HN. And I mean, these, these dudes, the way they move in short with their short area quickness, it's, it's mm -hmm. special. And you can see some of the trigger stuff that you mentioned with Matt Milano. You see signs of that with Terrell Bernard. And I think that makes this defense you know, special, but also the aggressiveness. I mean, Brian Baldinger put out a clip this morning. I retweeted it. 
And it was really good showing the Greg Rousseau sack on the fourth down play where they sent the pressure with Milano uh, taking the right tackle uh, or the left tackle away and freeing up Rousseau, who's six foot eight coming in on the quarterback. It's like Sean's now in a situation where I think there's a level of trust with what Ken and Josh have going on the offensive side of the ball. He can really lean into the defense. And if you go back to the last couple of years, the defense is where, things have kind of faltered at times. Like you, you think of the Chiefs game in 13 seconds last year against the Bengals. The offense wasn't great, but the defense struggled as well. Now Sean seems like he's like, all right, I'm going back to my roots. I'm going to call this thing. And the early returns are just unbelievable. Yeah, and, and I, I love to see him enjoying it, right? It was great to see excitement. And he, you know, one of the things that he's always missed, I mean, you come into a, a head coaching role and you really miss that daily you know, teaching and coaching and one-to-ones with the players, you know, as a head coach, it's pretty much there as a, a people manager. Um, and the fact that he now gets to do what he loves, which is the X's and O's. And yes, he was involved in some ways when coach Frazier was there, but yeah, he's, he's imposing his identity now even more, which you can see in the aggressive play calling nature. I mean, some of those early on pressures, the way that they were, you know, able to send Tredavious as, as kind of triggers, it was just, there are so many great little pieces of the puzzle and it. And what I love is it's still really complementary of each other, right? It's still a, very much so a team game plan when it comes to, you know, D line backers, your, your DBs and the way that they all understand it, because he's able to present a menu of items that can look totally different, you know, so a simple menu, but you just disguise it, which is essentially what the dolphins do, right? They don't necessarily do anything fancy, but they disguise it and they do it really well with speed. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, seriously, uh, speaking of speed and talent offensively, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars, they're next up here. And I I wanted to touch on them quickly because it's been kind of like a disjointed start to the season. They come out hot, have a couple of games where it doesn't go as well. What are your impressions of Trevor Lawrence? And uh, I don't know how much you were able to watch of that game yesterday, but we didn't see much of it. It seemed like uh, never really close. Uh, 23-7, uh, I believe was the final. Yeah, 23-7. Yeah. Tra- mm-hmm. tra- Trevor Lawrence with 207 in the touchdown. Atlanta has a good defense. But what are your thoughts on, on this Jags team and what the Bills face on Sunday? I mean, I think Calvin Ridley has been a, a game changer for them, really just adding that extra weapon with Christian Kirk being able to complement um, – you know, and they've always had a really great run game since they brought Etienne in. I mean, I think he's been he's been incredible since last season, the way that he's really taken off and and as a young running back too. I'd say Trevor Lawrence has he has absolutely developed, right? I think even just having Doug Peterson in the building has been incredible for him. Getting that consistency, someone who thinks like a quarterback, who's been there, done that, can really help him with his growth and maturation. I just there's just moments where I think the ball is just a little too high. I mean, we saw not not the game against the Falcons, but the one the week before where it could have been an easy win for them if the ball was just two inches lower, you know, and there's there's just way too many of those little mistakes. And, and Trevor Lawrence is great. He takes accountability. He puts that on himself. But at some point, y- your actions need to change. And I, I'd love to see more of that accuracy coming from him because he's got the strength, he's got the size, but he just doesn't always seem to put it together. And and lucky really that the the defense are are really they can be so dominant. You know, Josh Allen getting after it with the sacks. You had the the interceptions to help them win these games, you know, whether it's through Andre Cisco or um Trayvon Walker, you know, all these guys play a big role in it. Um I, I think looking into the game this Sunday. It's, it's always interesting in terms of when you have teams coming to London because everybody manages that so differently. Mm-hmm. This will be the first time that the Jags have been here for what will be two weeks. So what does that look like during the week whilst they're here? You know, they've had they've had history of getting in trouble again with different, different ownership. Um, you know, but how do you manage that? Because you need to still keep them in a normal environment, you know, as – as much as possible, which is tough when you're in a foreign country and they don't have their, their normal amenities. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you look at the actual matchup between, between the bills and the Jags, if the bills can play as consistently as they have done the the game against Miami, for example, but also, you know, the use, the use of the run game has massively opened things up the way that 
Josh is, you know, playing from under center, being able to open up the play action game. Obviously you got the run game off the back of that. Um, just like James Cook has been incredible. That's kind of that back that people have been mm-hmm. wanting for so long and, and needing really to just help it get explosion. I know that's what Coach McDermott wants as well. Um, but being in a situation where Josh Allen doesn't have to feel like he's the guy that has to make the plays and that that pressure's on him, pretty much the Dolphins game majority of the time, whether it was Diggs, Gabe Davis, or his tight ends who came up clutch, um, you know, always kind of staying ahead of the sticks like that. And it was – taking time off the clock and you know it was it was just a really beautifully called game and then obviously everything that the Bills defense do you know if and fingers crossed on you know obviously I saw with Tredavious going down and you know some injuries across the board and um Taron Johnson and you know I hope that everyone is is okay um but if they can play the game that they have been playing and playing the way they have been playing with that kind of aggressive mentality and they can be more aggressive against the Jags than they were necessarily against Miami because obviously Miami have that speed, which just changes what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Tredavious thing. I mean, it's, you know, people are still reeling around here as you, as you very well know. Um, He's one of those guys like in the city, like within the team, obviously, I mean, all the players and coaches talking about it after the game and what he means to everybody. I mean, emotional Sean McDermott at the podium. Um, it's just heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking sport sometimes when, when things like this happen, like you do wonder why, like a guy that worked as hard as he worked to get back, then to have it all potentially now taken away from him for another grueling, you know, he, I remember talking to him after, um, when he first started getting back to practice in the regular season last year. And he said that there were, he told all of us, there were dark times where he would lock himself in his basement and dealing with the depression of not having the game that he loved. And I mean, you know, uh, Tredavious, you, he was here when you were here. I mean, uh, how awful is this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really, it really broke my heart yesterday watching him because he, he, as an athlete, you know, when it's not good. Right. And the way that he screamed and he threw his helmet and he was just covering his eyes, like, Oh, he just knew exactly. And, and the struggle of overcoming an injury, you know, for so many people, you just think, okay, go on rehab. You'll be back in six, 10 months, whatever that looks like, but it is completely that mental turmoil. And he's such a happy go lucky (laughs) guy. He brings so much great energy and it's hard sometimes when you're like, all right, I need to force this energy, but inside I don't feel like the guy that I'm presenting. And so for him, I think the support of the team is going to be massive and keeping him in the building as much as possible, finding ways for him to be more and more involved with the team, you know, whatever that means, it's just, it's, it starts to also after a while get in your head, right? Like, come on, I just came back from this ACL injury on the other side. Now I've got Achilles on this side. You know, what else you, it makes you start thinking like, what else could happen here? It's horrible. Really horrible. Um, we're waiting for the definitive update uh, on that. Uh, but, you know, sending thoughts Absolutely. out to Trey and his family, man. That is, it's brutal for, you know, we, I cover the team. I'm a, I'm a media member, but you know, these are human beings that, you know, you get, you get a chance to know. Uh, and he's, he's really one of the good ones. So it's a bummer. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, you know, now that there's, you know, we've had so many years here of the NFL coming to the UK, you talk to people around the league, uh, the experience that people have on the ground there. What is it like for teams? Like, what have you noticed the teams that really have success over there? you know, how they handle the whole trip. What are kind of the key ingredients to it all, to going over there and having it be a normal game week? Yeah, I mean, I think acclimating, like we talked about earlier, you know, just staying awake as soon as you get here, pushing through on that and and being active. Recovery plays such a big role. I mean, even you think flying, how that will affect you, compression, making sure you're getting all your sleep and eating enough food. You know, the food is different as well, right? I think we probably have some more similarities to Buffalo in terms of the the weather here. Uh, it's kind of rainy and gloomy outside right now. Um, so you know, if you're a hot if you're a hot place uh, team coming over here, it's not great for you. But you know, I think so many people just enjoy being in the atmosphere, and you get to the game. And I know Trevor Lawrence was talking about it in one of his interviews, but. He was like, people are just cheering at random times that they wouldn't normally cheer in the States. You know, there's a flag and people are cheering. And But you've got all 32 teams represented. You've got 
literally years and years of history. People are so passionate and they're so excited. And, you know, Bill's Mafia is a big deal over here. So I think that, you know, if you can, if when the Buffalo Bills come over here and they run out onto that field and they see Josh Allen, they see Stephon Diggs, the place is going to uproar because they want to so badly be a part of Bill's Mafia in the States, right? They want to feel what that feels like that we see on TV and people get so excited for. So, you know, I think obviously the the practicing side and all of that is just taking care of your body and, and trying to be on this regular schedule. But the other side is like embrace this really cool opportunity that not many people get because for some of these athletes, this might be their first time that they ever even leave the country. Indeed. I mean, man, that's crazy when you think about it, like what that's got to be like to kind of go through uh, a, a week of not only the travel, it's a, it's a little bit different, obviously the longer flight, but uh, just the culture shock, if you will, that's, uh, that's really interesting to think about. So we have a, a shout insider uh, line that we have been bringing to all of you fans uh, over the last, I think I want to say eight weeks now, uh, shout uh, Buffalo Bills insider text line. You can become a subscriber right now. If you t- text 716-528-6727, uh, get yourself a two week free trial. And uh, as always, the text line is brought to you by uh, Litro Law Group and Carrie C. Buyer. Uh, if you or someone you know is injured, make sure you give them a call um, or just go to LitroLaw.com. They'll they'll have you hooked up. They'll give you the number on there uh, and get you going. Um, we got to get going here in a minute, but this has been such a fun conversation. And I don't want it to end because I got a couple other things that I want to ask you. And I'll try to be super, super quick. Um, so, with flag football, right? Like, I mean, obviously something that you're super passionate about. I was watching one of your um, interviews that you did recently. I think it was on uh, Good Morning Football talking about, you know, maybe getting flag into the Olympics here coming up. Where do things stand with that? Because it's a really exciting time actually in Western New York. The first uh, women's flag football team has been assembled at a local university or a v- Villa Maria College. Uh, and they're starting play this season. And there's a lot of excitement around town. Uh, some of the high school level uh, flag football teams have really had some success over the last couple of years. So I feel like it's excitement is bubbling around the sport. I feel like that would blow it up if it was part of the Olympics. Oh my gosh, massively. It's been so cool because I get to be with Preston and the community team every year. And we do a big girls jamboree as well. So I've loved seeing that grow. But I mean, literally aiming to get it in the 2028 Olympics that will be LA. So it makes sense to have a sport that is representative of the country that it's within. Um, but, you know, flag football is the, the non-contact version of the sport and it's far fewer barriers to participation, right? You need a flag belt and a football. So it's a sport that can be played worldwide. It's also a sport that it's kind of a level playing field for girls and boys alike. So you can come in, it's it's any shape, size, all your skill abilities are able to be pulled into this one incredible sport. And it's cool because also you, you talked about the girl situation there. You can also get a scholarship as a young female going into college, mm-hmm. um, NAIA, JUCO, um, the AC, uh, NCAA East now. So there's so many opportunities to be playing you when you get to play flag football and get an education it doesn't get much better than that <laughs> definitely um it, it doesn't get much better than uh your life uh playing football coaching football talking about football on tv where do you <laughs> see yourself in 10 years I, I always like to ask this question because maybe even five years we don't have to go that far down the line but with everything that you're doing like how do you how do you see yourself transitioning, you know, into this next phase here as you are you are, are how much longer are you do plan on playing? Actually, I want to ask that too. Hopefully not much longer. I need somebody yeah. to replace me here. I'm, I'm 34 <laughs> now, right? So it's not it's not my uh, forever dream. It's a great excuse for me to be motivated to work out. I'll say mm-hmm. that. Um, but you know, I'll be honest, I definitely miss the elite coaching side. There's mm-hmm. really no replacement for I'm sure you can imagine being a part of an NFL team. Um but over here has been great having Sky Sports and having that kind of analyst role allows me to break down game film, talk about football, be a part of a team, because ultimately that's, I think, I know for myself, that's really what I desire is being a part of a team, building to create something better. And I get to educate people and and kind of share the growth and love of American football um, now to the whole world, which seems kind of crazy. <laughs> Seriously. Um, <laughs> this has been awesome. 
Thank you so much for taking uh, some of your time on what I'm sure is going to be uh, a super busy week. Now, tell us a little bit too, what are your plans this week? Do you do you have plans to uh, see the Bills, spend any time during the week at any community events? What's, what's the schedule look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a Jags event one of the evenings for a, a scholarship function that they're doing. Practice Friday with Bills. Um, Mr. Rob and I are getting dinner, <laughs> so nice. I've said it. He can't. He can't ditch me now. Um, but yes, <laughs> the community events, and then um, you know, just trying to see as many of of the guys as possible. You know, when you're part of a team, the staff, those all those coaches are are my people. So I just I'm expecting a lot of cuddles. That's really what I want. I want hugs from everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, our audience is sending hugs for you for coming on today. Make sure you find Phoebe on X, Twitter, whatever you call it these days, at Phoebe underscore Schechter for uh, a bunch of football coverage. Great timeline. All of the above. Enjoy the week. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank you.